Welcome to the Global Health and Development Session. Our guest for this session is Dr. Neil Buddy Shah, the Managing Director at GiveWell. Uh, Buddy uh, was previously the CEO and co-founder at ID Insight, and he also worked at the World Bank at the MIT's uh, Poverty Action Lab, JPL. He holds an AB from Harvard, an MD from Einstein College of Medicine, and an MPA in International Development from Harvard Kennedy School. Buddy, welcome to the Effective Giving Day. Thanks, Pablo. It's great to be here. Great. Uh, let's jump uh, right in. Uh, for those of us that are familiar with the effective giving space, uh, GiveWell is the gold standard when it comes to helping people that are living in lower income countries. However, for those in the audience who are maybe newer to the, to the movement, um, other institutions like large universities, uh, maybe the Gates Foundation, or maybe a Nobel Prize winner or two, uh, may be more familiar. Uh, could you explain what GiveWell's role is in the effective giving space? And also very specifically, how you think about effectiveness? Yeah, thanks, Pablo. It's a great question. Uh, and it's certainly true that there are a lot of organizations and individuals doing great work in this broader space. You know, I think the question that GiveWell is just obsessed with is how can we direct funding to find the opportunities that improve human well-being the most per dollar? In other words, where are the places where we can turn dollars into lives saved or incomes improved the most per dollar? And I think this core obsession around maximizing the impact of every dollar you spend has a number of flow through effects to what we do and what distinguishes us and hopefully makes us valuable in this broader space. So I think the first element of that um, is that we're looking to find the few number of opportunities that improve lives the most in the world, rather than trying to generate new evidence or rate all of the charities that exist. So we're really trying to find the very best giving opportunities in the world and to package those in a way that are really actionable if you're someone that's trying to figure out where should I make, spend my charitable dollars so that they improve lives the most. Um, and once you get into the weeds with that broader framing of how do we use dollars to improve lives as much as possible, um, I think it has a number of implications for how GiveWell does its work. The first is that you know, we spend a lot of time scouring the academic literature and talking to experts as well as practitioners in the field running global health and development programs to try to figure out which are the programs that have evidence of most effectiveness. Uh, and so we're not, we're looking through all the literature, published papers that show and try to understand the effectiveness of different kinds of programs and then take a very critical eye into which of those are better versus worse. So it's not enough for us to say, you know, program X has found to improve the health of people in this country. We're trying to figure out, well, is that the best way? And do those findings actually hold up in um, other countries or if you scale them up in practice beyond just uh, the contours of a particular academic study? So the first core characteristic is searching for the opportunities that have robust evidence of effectiveness. The second is that even if a program has been proven to improve lives, we're interested in finding out how much do they improve lives per dollar. So thinking about the cost effectiveness of different programs um, and then comparing them against each other so that we can actually have some kind of ranked ordering around which programs do the most good per dollar spent. And then finally layering on all the practical questions around is this organization uh, able to deliver the program in really challenging environments do they have room for more funding? A lot of organizations might just be at the full capacity in terms of their organizational um, abilities. Can they actually turn new dollars into effective spending and continue to save or improve lives uh, as much as possible? Uh, and when you put together all of these things of scouring the evidence uh, and the literature base for the most effective giving opportunities and really having the lens of which is most cost effective, um, you end up with this list uh, of a small number of organizations that save or improve lives um, with incredible cost effectiveness. And over just last year, based on Givel's recommendations, uh, our community of donors were able to direct over $150 million to these programs. Uh, and happy to get into you know, some of the details uh, of, of what those programs actually look like in practice. Uh, that's, that's quite impressive. And uh, it's, I think it's really valuable work for, for donors uh, that face just so many, so many uh, options behind before them. Um, 
you've been looking for these uh, outstanding giving opportunities for over a decade now, uh, but um, your recommendations have tended not to change dramatically from one year to the next. However, I do know that there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes, thousands of hours of research. So can you explain what your research process looks like and how you constantly reevaluate your recommendations? Yeah, it's a great question, Pablo. And I mean, you're absolutely right. Over the last five years, the list isn't changing dramatically. We have added um, three new programs uh, and dropped one. But I think the high level takeaway for why the list doesn't change that much from year to year is that despite tens of thousands of hours of really talented, critical research time at Gibble that goes into this, um, it's not changing because these are exceptionally uh, cost-effective ways to save or improve lives. Uh, and so if you think about our list of recommended charities, you can broadly divide them into two buckets, programs that save lives and programs that improve incomes. Um, so life-saving or life-improving interventions. Um, and there's three parallel research processes that are going into generating this list. The first is that once something is already on the list, whether that's anti-malarial bed nets to protect children from getting malaria and dying, vitamin A supplementation to protect people from measles, diarrheal disease, and respiratory infections, um, that we want to make sure that just because something has been proven to be effective once, that it continues to deliver that impact at scale. So the first kind of set of research priorities is doing the due diligence every year to make sure that our top charities continue to save or improve lives with extreme cost effectiveness. So the types of research activities that we're doing in that first bucket are looking at every organization's monitoring data from each year. Are they continuing to deliver these effective programs to the scale um, and with the fidelity that uh, we need to see in order to believe that they're continuing to have a lot of impact. Another type of thing that we're doing in continually vetting the existing top charities is actually updating our views on their cost effectiveness based on changes in the academic literature. So just last year, we did an analysis around modeling how long we think anti-malarial bed nets actually last in the field. Because, you know, we have this whole model that it's $5 to deliver and hang a bed net in a rural part of a malaria endemic region in Africa, um, but a lot of the cost effectiveness of how many lives uh, are gonna be saved with donations to antimalarial bed nets depends on how long they actually last in the field. You know, they're gonna be uh, subject to all kinds of things that, um, you know, daily use, weather, et cetera. And so whether a bed net lasts for a year versus two years versus three years has big implications for how cost effective it is and whether there's another opportunity that might be better than it. Um, and then finally, we also fund new research to update our views on how cost effective existing charities are. So in you know, the next guest, the keynote speaker is, um, you know, a colleague of, of GiveWell's, Michael Kramer, and GiveWell funded a 20-year follow-up study that Professor Kramer and co-authors did to see how much do kids' incomes improve if they receive anti-parasitic deworming medications when they're kids. And so those are the types of activities that we need to keep on investigating in order to make sure that the things that are already on the list are continually um, saving or improving lives as much as we think they are, and so that we can have a really refined, up-to-date list of those. But in parallel to vetting the top charities, the research team is also constantly scouring the literature, talking to experts and practitioners around what are new potential programs that could save or improve lives more than the current places that we're investing in. Um, and this work is really important and exciting. And while over the last five or six years, it's only led to three additional top charity recommendations, I think that's more a sign that what's already on the list is really, really cost effective at turning philanthropic dollars into improved lives um, rather than a real, you know, rather than any lack of effort in trying to find things that can outperform those. Um, and then the third type of work that goes into our research process and making sure that these, in fact, are some of the best ways to turn your dollars into improvements in human well-being is actually trying to improve our core cost effectiveness model. So a lot of our decision making is informed by a cost effectiveness model that we apply to any charity that we evaluate. Um, and there are just some really tough questions embedded in that. So, for instance, anyone that's trying to do good in the world is inevitably gonna be forced between choosing between different outcomes that all look good. So do you 
save someone's life by investing in a public health intervention? Do you try to improve someone's income through cash transfers? Or do you invest in improving educational outcomes? If you have a fixed amount of money, you need to make certain moral trade-offs around do you save someone's life or do you improve their income? Um, and you know, we're constantly trying to answer that question both through our own internal process uh, as well as having doing large-scale surveys with the communities and individuals that are affected by our programs to better understand how they make those trade-offs between programs that could save lives of members of their community versus improve their incomes. Excellent. Um, I do want to remind our audience that we may have time for maybe one or two questions at the end of the, of the session. Uh, but before that, uh, I hear you have actually published your list of uh, 2020 recommendations. And this year there is a change. So uh, do you want to briefly um, mention the charities that repeat in that list? And which is this organization that has been able to secure a spot in this really hard to get into list? Yeah, absolutely. So on the income improving uh, side, there are two. One is Give Directly's cash transfers, which just find some of the lowest income households in the world and directly transfers them cash. Uh, and those through randomized control trials, we found that those households actually, you know, they're the ones that know their problems best and, and can do a lot of good with just direct cash transfers. Um, the other income improving intervention is deworming. So providing um, pills for children to get rid of parasitic infections uh, and just a hundred dollars can deworm 100 kids. And the interesting thing based on Professor Kramer's work and others is that that investment leads to over a thousand dollars in increased income over the lifetime of these kids. So large economic increase from early childhood deworming. And then on the life-saving side, we have several organizations, and within deworming, the organizations are things like Evidence Action, Sight Savers, Schistosomiasis Control Initiative, and the End Fund. And then on the life-saving side, all of our life-saving interventions, you can roughly save the life of one individual between three to $5,000, which is you know, really incredible um, when you think about being able to actually save the life of someone who otherwise would have died. Um, and those are largely within preventable public health diseases. So in malaria, malaria consortium, seasonal malaria, chemo prevention for $7 treats a child during the high season of malaria. Um, and ends up saving a life for every three or five thousand dollars spent um, against malaria foundations long-lasting insecticide treated bed nets it's five dollars to distribute a net um, and then vitamin a supplementation with helen keller international um, vitamin a supplementation protects people against diarrheal disease measles and respiratory infection over a quarter million people die every year from vitamin a um, supplementation related illnesses um, and then finally the most recent is new incentives program in northern Nigeria where there's very low immunization rates. We know that by immunizing children you can save a lot of lives and so new incentives provides conditional cash transfers for families to go to the clinic to help offset the cost of traveling there to get overcome behavioral burdens and get more children immunized and $47 leads to um, an additional complete immunization. And again, like the other life-saving interventions, this amounts to around three to $5,000 per death averted, um, which is really incredible when you think about it. Um, and that program, we were funding as early as 2014 to incubate new incentives, conditional cash transfers program. Um, and it just goes to show how long it takes to work through operational models and actually generate the evidence to show that a program is really effective and meets this bar um, of extreme cost effectiveness. It is amazing when you think uh, how much we invest in saving a life in, in rich countries, uh, $3,000 to $5,000 is, is um, an incredible deal, I think, for donors. Um, okay, unless we have uh, questions from the audience or, or maybe before, uh, one final question uh, would be, I know that GiveWell is constantly looking for ways to expand the research. Um, how, how are you thinking about this? Where are you looking? And are, are there any avenues that look uh, especially promising as of today? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, under the headline mission that we have, which is how do we improve human well-being as much as possible um, per dollar spent? So far, we focus on finding true, proven, cost-effective programs with a lot of evidence behind them. 
Um, and as you could tell from my description, that often means directly funding a health commodity or sending cash to someone. But we're thinking about areas where we could have more leverage per dollar spent. And two examples that we're currently actively researching come to mind. The first is in policy change and technical assistance. So, you know, the governments of developing countries are by far the largest spenders in global health and development. And so rather than directly buying bed nets or distributing pills, what if we could invest in an organization that helps to improve the effectiveness of the government spending their own money, um, which is often in the billions of dollars or multilateral that are spending billions of dollars, uh, and you get a lot more leverage per philanthropic dollar spent. I think there's a big question of how cost effective that is because it relies on other individuals besides the ones that we're funding, but thinking about, you know, can we influence policy? Can we improve the effectiveness of, of government programming is one area. Um, and uh, I think it remains to be seen whether we find areas there that outperform the current top charities, but it does seem promising that, you know, if we can get the government of Indonesia to improve their tobacco policy or support the government of Liberia in scaling up programs in preventive health space using global fund dollars or their own domestic spending, um, then that could be a big amplifier on the philanthropic dollars of GiveWell donors. I think that this idea of leverage is really interesting and uh, it, it really does reflect what effective giving is about, really looking for what are the avenues for greatest impact wherever they are, whether they are the ones that make you feel best or not. Um, yeah, okay, so, absolutely. Um, something I, I, I've, I, I did want to ask you as well. Um, you know, there are different organizations around, um, other evaluators have been mentioned before. Uh, what are common misconceptions or misunderstandings about what GiveWell does or what GiveWell does not do? Yeah, so, you know, I think there are a couple of misconceptions that come to mind. The first is that, you know, we're not a charity evaluator in the traditional sense. You know, GiveWell was started because, um, you know, some of my, my colleagues were basically trying to figure out how, where they should donate their own money. And they found a real lack of actionable information for everyday donors to figure out how do we turn our dollars into actual improvements in people's lives. Um, and so the whole evolution of GiveWell has really been about finding the best places to um, invest in that improve human lives the most, rather than trying to rate everything under the sun. And so what we're really looking to do is find the best giving opportunities rather than to try to rate everything that's out there. Um, I think the second misconception, uh, which you could even take away from our conversation so far, is that GiveWell is solely focused on organizations that have randomized control, really rigorous evidence. That certainly makes up the bulk of our recommendations to date. Um, but what we're really about, again, is finding the best giving opportunities. And some point down the line, that might include giving opportunities where there's less of a rigorous evidence base, but there's higher return upside. Um, and that, you know, there might be more risk, but you could cause a big change, say, by trying to um, help influence or inform a pu public policy decision. Um, and so, and then the third misconception is that, you know, we're just about global health. Um, and the reality is that it's just that we found really phenomenal giving opportunities there. We're open conceptually to other um, sectors and outcomes, but it's really got to beat this pretty difficult bar that you could take that $3,000 and spend it elsewhere, but you're going to forego saving someone's life who otherwise would have died. And so that other thing you invest in has got to be really, really good to forego spending it on these proven um, opportunities that can actually save someone's life. Uh, so I think those are some of the, the misconceptions um, and also reflection of some of GiveWell's own priorities as we look to the future. Perfect. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, for those of us working to bring effective giving to other countries, uh, the work you are doing is simply invaluable. So uh, thank you very much for what you do. Yeah, thanks a lot for the conversation, Pablo. Okay, so on to our next session. Thank you, buddy. Thanks.